This video is brought to you by pinesandmaples.ca, where you can find all sorts of great Canadian products made by Canadian creators. Enjoy. Leaving a few men behind to await the belated return of Loch Rafal, LaSalle and his men explored the southern end of Lake Michigan, subsisting on Indian corn and wild game, and narrowly avoiding a skirmish with a much larger party of native warriors. In accordance with their royal license, the explorers built a small fort at the mouth of the St. Joseph River at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, which they named Fort Miami. That accomplished, they traveled up the St. Joseph, portaged to the Kankakee River, and followed that waterway to the Illinois, up which Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet had traveled on their return journey to Lake Michigan five years prior. LaSalle and his men followed the Illinois River southwest, leaving the forests of the Great Lakes for the Great Plains. They lived off buffalo, which roamed the prairies in enormous herds, and on some corn that they discovered in the granary of a large abandoned native village, which would become known as the Grand Village of the Illinois. Four years earlier, following his and Louis Joliet's expedition to the Mississippi, Father Jacques Marquette had founded a mission at this site, which he named the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin. Shortly thereafter, he had attempted to return to his old mission of St. Ignace on the island of Michimackinac, but had succumbed to dysentery along the way. Downriver, LaSalle and his crew visited a large Illinois Indian camp. The natives attempted to discourage LaSalle and his crew from traveling further to the Mississippi, a valley they claimed was populated by hostile Indians, and the waters of which were infested with scaly monsters with long snouts and powerful jaws. Six of LaSalle's men heeded the warning and abandoned the expedition, preferring the hardships of the wilderness to the unknown terrors of the Mississippi. LaSalle and his remaining men spent the winter of 1679-1680 in a palisaded camp they built on the eastern bank of the Illinois River, which they dubbed Fort Crevacure, or Fort Heartbreak. That February, LaSalle's men began to construct a ship on the banks of the Illinois. This vessel was intended to replace Le Graffaut, which the crew now presumed lost with all hands. While the shipwrights went about their task, a reluctant Louis Hennepin and two of his fellow recollect missionaries, on LaSalle's orders, headed down the Illinois River with instructions to explore it to its confluence with the Mississippi. Meanwhile, LaSalle took a small party back up the Illinois River with the intention of traveling all the way to Montreal for supplies. Along the way, across the Illinois River, from the abandoned Grand Village of the Illinois, he noticed a cliff, which is known today as Starved Rock, perhaps due to the events of a siege which is said to have taken place there during the Seven Years' War. Believing the site to be an excellent location on which to build a defensive fortress, he sent a message downriver to Henry de Tanti, his most trusted lieutenant, instructing the Italian to construct a fort on top of the cliff, which was to be called Fort St. Louis. LaSalle and his small party continued to Montreal, crossing the lower peninsula of Michigan on foot. On the way, they narrowly avoided massacre at the hands of an Indian raiding party. In Montreal, LaSalle acquired much needed supplies and prepared to return to his men on the Illinois. Shortly before his departure, while paying a brief visit to Fort Frontenac, he received a letter from Henri de Tanti, informing him that shortly after his departure, nearly all of his men had deserted Fort Crevker, fearing an Iroquois attack. Incited by the voyager Martin Chartier, they raided the fort's storehouse of everything they could carry, throwing the rest of the supplies into the river before destroying the fort itself. The mutineers then retreated to Canada, destroying Fort Miami and plundering the gunpowder at Fort Niagara on the way. Twelve of them were on their way to Fort Frontenac where they intended to kill LaSalle in order to escape his retribution. LaSalle, accompanied by five men, immediately set out to ambush the inbound mutineers. He and his party took the rebels by surprise and captured them, killing two of them in the process. The deserters were placed in custody and delivered to Count Frontenac for trial. Previously, back on the Illinois River, Henry de Tanti learned of the mutiny at Fort Crevker while making preparations for the construction of Fort St. Louis atop Starved Rock. Accompanied by the three recollect missionaries who had neglected to partake in the rebellion, he salvaged what supplies he could and took up residence in the abandoned Grand Village of the Illinois. The Illinois band that had previously inhabited the village soon returned and allowed the white men to remain among them. 
One afternoon, an Illinois scout ran breathless into the village with the alarming news that a war party of Iroquois warriors was inbound. Among their number, he declared, were a Jesuit priest and the explorer La Salle. Although these two characters, in actual fact, were Iroquois war chiefs dressed in black hats and doublets, the scout's report caused the Illinois villagers to suspect that Tanti and the Recollect missionaries had something to do with the incoming war party. Their suspicions were allayed when Tanti volunteered himself and his comrades to fight alongside the Illinois against the Iroquois. The Illinois defenders met the Iroquois warriors in a plain outside the village. As the two parties advanced towards each other, Henry de Tanti ran before the warriors and held up a calumet, or peace pipe, in the hope that he might avert the imminent battle. An Iroquois warrior promptly stabbed him in the chest, not realizing that he was a white man. Fortunately, the knife glanced off Tanti's ribcage, giving the swarthy Italian a deep gash rather than mortal wound. One of the Iroquois chiefs, upon observing that Tanti's ears were not pierced, deduced that he must be a Frenchman and attempted to doctor his laceration. The Iroquois then argued over whether to scalp Tanti, burn him at the stake, or set him free. After some debate, they sent the Italian back to the Illinois, staggering from his rapid loss of blood and bearing a wampum, or a clamshell, belt, a token of peace. Afraid that this gesture constituted an attempt to catch them off guard, the Illinois retreated, abandoning their village to the Iroquois. The Frenchmen remained behind with the Iroquois, with whom France was still officially at peace, and watched as the warriors, bereft of their victory, vented their rage on the village itself. The Iroquois burnt down the grand village of the Illinois and dug up its graves, mutilating the corpses of the dead and erecting their skulls on poles. The Illinois returned several days later, keeping a respectable distance between themselves and their ruined village. The Iroquois sent Tanti to mediate a truce between their two parties and to convince the Illinois to leave the country. When Tanti accomplished that task, the Iroquois ordered the Frenchmen to head back to New France. Fearing that the natives would murder them all if they failed to comply, the explorers headed up the Illinois River. They proceeded to trudge through the woods all the way back to Green Bay in Lake Michigan, losing the eldest of the friars to a party of Kickapoo warriors who scalped and murdered the Recollect while he was praying alone in a meadow. Meanwhile, the Iroquois war party followed the retreating Illinois villagers down the Illinois River, watching them from the opposite bank. At the river's confluence with the Mississippi, the Illinois split into three separate groups, one of which the Iroquois ambushed. Although the Illinois warriors escaped the clutches of the Iroquois, their wives and children were not so fortunate. In a field on the banks of the Mississippi, the Iroquois warriors tortured hundreds of Illinois women and children to death. While Henry de Conti and the Recollect Friars were having their own misadventures at the Grand Village of Illinois, Father Louis Hennepin and two friars were exploring the lower Illinois River and the upper Mississippi beyond. On April 10th, while repairing their canoe on the riverbank in preparation for their journey up the Mississippi, the priests were set upon by a party of canoe-going Eastern Dakota Sioux warriors. After debating amongst themselves, the Sioux decided to take the missionaries captive rather than execute them as some of their number desired. The Sioux and their priestly prisoners traveled up the Mississippi River to the site of present-day St. Paul, Minnesota, where they disembarked. From there, they traveled overland to their village on the shores of a northerly body of water known today as Mill Lax Lake, located about 80 miles southwest of the southwesterly end of Lake Superior. Instead of burning the friars alive, as Hennepin suspected they might do, the Sioux adopted the Franciscans as their sons. The missionaries were then separated and sent to live with their self-styled fathers in separate villages. In a later reminiscence, Hennepin described how the Sioux, in an effort to restore him to health, his having deteriorated on the grueling journey to the village, treated him in a sweat lodge, a ceremonial steam bath common among the natives of the Great Plains and the Great Lakes. Hoping to return to French-Canadian society, Hennepin told the Sioux that French traders would be arriving shortly at the mouth of the Wisconsin River on the Mississippi. The Sioux, who were on the brink of starvation, were eager to acquire guns to facilitate hunting and decided to pay these supposed Frenchmen a visit. Taking the friars along with them, they paddled their canoes across Mill Lax Lake and followed its outlet, the scenic Rum River, to the upper Mississippi, about 20 miles upriver from the place at which they had disembarked on their homeward journey. About 16 miles downriver from this point, near what is now downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota, the party came to a waterfall in the middle of the river, 
which Hennepin dubbed the Falls of St. Anthony. When Hennepin's adopted father reached the mouth of the Wisconsin River and failed to find any French traders, he admonished the friar for lying, but decided to let him live. Hennepin and his religious brothers subsequently traveled down the Mississippi to the Chippewa River, where they participated in a Sioux buffalo hunt. Near the end of the hunt, the Sioux received news that five white men had arrived in Sioux territory from Lake Superior. These men had somehow heard about Hennepin and his fellow friars and were interested in learning more about them. Eager to meet the Europeans, the Sioux and the friars traveled back upriver, where they intercepted the five white men not far from the falls of St. Anthony. As it turned out, the five white men were Cour de Bois, led by Daniel Graysolon, Sir Dulou, a former gendarme or elite French cavalryman, a veteran of the Franco-Dutch War, and a relative of Henri de Tanti, who would become the namesake of Duluth, Minnesota. The previous summer, Dulou had, with the blessing of Count Frontenac, traveled to Lake Superior and brokered a peace between the Sioux and Ojibwa, hoping that such a peace might facilitate the fur trade in the westerly Great Lakes. He also sent some of his men to accompany a Sioux band bound for the eastern Dakota heartland west of Lake Superior. In the summer of 1680, these scouts had returned with news that a salt lake lay some distance to the west. Like La Salle, Dulu had a desire to discover the Northwest Passage and hoped that this salt lake constituted an inlet of the Pacific Ocean. When he heard that three white friars were held captive by the Sioux, he and his men set out southwest into the wilderness, hoping to rescue the white men and learn more about this westerly salt lake. Dulu convinced the Sioux to release their prisoners and brought Hennepin and his countrymen to Michimackinac by way of Green Bay. Hennepin proceeded to make the long journey to Montreal and then to France, where he would spend the rest of his life. <laughs>